what we try and do is we try and really embody great culture. I talked about employees not leaving, right? How much, how expensive it is to invest all that into an employee. Would you say it's one of the most expensive things running a business? I mean, you've developed and sold many businesses. So is it? Um, You know, it was an easy one over technology in the past. But technology is really important. However, the people are still more important. And, you know, we have rules here. You can never just say to somebody, you have to do this. You know, we're doing this because. So we have seven people that are a tech team, full-time tech. And a lot of companies go wrong because they just say, okay, here's what you have to do, and they make it you know, broken down. We bring them in on the why behind it because a lot of times we're this morning. You saw me do the update, right? Yeah, I loved it. So we talked about PCE, the personal consumption expenditure, okay. one of the economic reports. Most people don't know. Tech person, usually not something that would be within their realm of, of you know things that they would care about, know about. Uh, but... Before they wrote that, put that graph up there, it wasn't the graph. We didn't want that. We wanted them to understand the meaning behind it. So when they're putting that graph, it's like the person who makes that delicious sauce that does it with love. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So they know what's behind it. So what we're trying to do is get them to help us convey a message. And it's like that with everything. Everything that we put out there, let's really make sure that we're doing it with maximum efficacy. We want it to be impactful for the for our subscriber, for that customer who looks at it, for that real estate agent who's using it. Whatever it is, I'm just pointing out one tiny little thing. Yeah. But you know, we're talking about culture here. Mm. So it, it's really interesting, Jay, because culture is there's so many different things with regards to culture. So one of the fun things I get to do is I, I sing in a band. Okay. So yeah. So it's 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 a lot of fun for me, okay. And and hey, in spite of me, we have a really really good band, okay. But um, we've we've played the huge parties before the Super Bowl. We've got all you know, every athlete's there. You know, I brought uh, Russell Wilson up on stage with wow. me to sing, and but but everybody's there. I mean, heck, we had J Lo in the audience. So it, pretty awesome stuff that I uh, that I've been able to fortunately experience. And the person who puts this together is a, a guy that is the CEO of Wheels Up, Kenny Dichter, who we've become good friends. So he's hired us the last couple of years. We've already been booked to do Atlanta. And Kenny and I have become friends, and so much so that Kenny called me um, the day before the event, Saturday morning, and he says, hey, Barry, I got something special for you. I said, what do you want? <laughs> Kenny's like this amazing guy, okay? What, what, why Kenny? He says, you want to have breakfast with Belichick? Oh. I said, are you freaking kidding me? So, yeah, and I've done it twice now. We're a small group, you know, just a small table. Uh, I just wanted to sit at this man's feet and learn. You want to talk about culture and understanding culture? Um, you know, there were so many things that I learned from that short period of time. And, you know, one of them is that um, even great players can't overcome bad coaching. Interesting. And then he went on to show examples on the football wow. field, right? But I'm thinking in my business. So you translate with that. Oh, you have to, right? You have to because uh, I love sports. I've always loved sports. But sports is really translatable to business and, uh, and to life. Mm. So am I being the best coach that I can be? You know, um, I bet you there's a lot of salespeople who haven't recorded their own conversations. Now, I used to do this as a salesperson. And it really accelerates you through because when you're in the heat of battle, and what I mean by that is you're on the phone with a customer. And I'm just saying it as, as a term, okay? Look, this is all obviously, you're not battling. It's, it's, it's a nice When we first talked on the phone, it was, I thought you were buttering a bagel. Oh. You were smooth, man. I told you that. Too. <laughs> Thanks. So well, there was no battle for anyone listening. No, so, we're, so but, but you don't realize the stuff that comes out of your mouth. And it's so meaningful to be able to reflect on that when you're not in the middle of it and say, holy crap, did I just say that? Why in the world would I say it? Like, no wonder why I didn't get that customer. So when you started in this, as a salesperson in, was it 1986? 86, in the mortgage industry? Very good, thank you, yes. You, you didn't just ago. work hard. You didn't just work hard. You recorded and, and took preparation into becoming better. You, you have to, don't you? I mean, if you watch if, sports again, yeah. watch, watch any sporting event, what are they looking at when they're on the sidelines? The film, because the film doesn't lie. So. But if you're not looking at the film, how can you course correct? How can you 
improve for the next play? How can you improve for the next time you speak with that customer and get to someplace better? And even better yet, you'll underscore the things you did very well because you say, man, that was good. I, I Did that give it you confidence Heck to yeah. go redo it? This, is, this game is all about confidence. It's all about, not cockiness, but confidence. Where does, okay, so some people get those two misconstrued. How do you define them? The difference between your confidence versus a cockiness? You should always remain humble. You know, look, I never forgot where I came from, and I always have empathy for individuals. And if you have a heart of, you never want to sell someone, right? Uh, you want to help them. And if the fit's not right, you be sincere and you be authentic that the fit's not right. But if the fit's right and you're authentic and humble, it goes an awfully long way. It's really important. I mean, you can have nice things, you can have successes, but you can still be humble and remember that, you know, there but for the grace of God, things could be very, very different. You should be very, I mean, I start the day every day with a lot of gratitude. That's you know, fantastic. That's I start every morning. Um, that's, that's really important. So when you're in the sales process, then are, you're listening intently if what you're talking to them about is going to benefit them. Absolutely. And Have then you make a first. decision if really you're selecting them or not. Of it sounds like. That's 100% right. You have to see that there's a fit there. Was it early in your business? Because, and we'll get into And I do want to finish the point that we're making. Yeah, no, yeah. But, 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 so just please just hang yeah. on to that. My brain is melting, by I'm the so, way. <laughs> so no, this is all no, amazing. You're super, you're super, you're super sharp. So here's the like thing. Like a just, Cutco. <laughs> so, they're so, not giving you money. So, um. Here's the thing, is that going back to culture, yeah. it made me think about, number one, this is something I did. Am I listening to their conversations? Mm -hmm. And it is really, really a great learning experience as a teacher, as to try to be a great coach, like Belichick was saying, to help your sales team. Are the managers who are listening, listening to their sales team's calls, and then bringing them in and making constructive adjustments so that you can really accelerate the career. You know, we talked that we talked offline about, you know, longevity in a custom, in a company with your people, how people are so important, right? Yes. If you want to keep your people, okay? I mean, we talked about show them appreciation, make sure that they're compensated more than fairly, right? Yes. We, we talked about these are cornerstones. Don't ever have someone ask you for an increase. You should anticipate that and take care of them. But the real magic sauce here, okay, is make them better. Make them better. So you believe in training them? Yeah, but not just training books. Okay. Training life. Interesting. Okay? Make them better all around. Just make Better them people? Better people, better equipped, and give them the ability to have more successes in what they're doing every day. Have them convert more opportunities because they're better prepared and they're better empowered than their competition. Were those some of the things that worked for you that you translate to them? That's everything, you know, if you want, I mean, look, uh, it's all about conversion, right? When you're, and, and how do you convert? You, you convert with trust. Trust is so important. How do, how do you build trust? You build trust by never selling somebody, telling them everything that's bad, mm -hmm. right? Tell them, you have to take that person and put them as if, forget the chairs being, on, bring them over here, make believe they're your kid, your parent, your best friend, your brother, somebody you care about, if this is a transaction that you've had experience in and they don't, what would you tell them to watch out for? And imagine having that conversation with the customer. So instead of in telling them what is great about your product, no, tell, tell them about tell the them. things that are going wrong. You can certainly present your product in ways that highlight the benefits. Of course, we all want to do that, right? But you should also explain to them what the potential pitfalls and what the areas that they should be concerned about because that will make it real for them. You know, if you do that, you give them an experience that's very different. Where did that wisdom come from? Was it a who or a what? Was it a mentor or a happening? So, listen, um, I started, this is where I came from. Yeah. I started selling stereo equipment out of the trunk of my car when I was a young kid, okay? So, yes. I was a hustler. That's what it's about. So, so really, I'd, I'd go to different neighborhoods, okay. stereo equipment, me and my buddies, trunk, our, our cars filled How with stuff. 21 years old. Okay. So, um, so 21, 22, 23. So here I am, I'm selling stereo equipment out of the trunk of my car and I'd buy the stuff in Manhattan. I'd go out to different neighborhoods and I'd walk in and say, hey, can you use anything for, oh, I'm sorry. I'd walk in and say, how you doing? I've got a great deal on stereo equipment for the house or car. Could you use anything for yourself today? Because you have to sell them today, right? And so 
this was, I, I've got a, okay. So yeah, yeah, for years. So <laughs> by the way, a gazillion hysterical stories and adventures that this, could you imagine a bunch of young guys, ah, the yeah. adventures you get yourself into, That's the people book. that you meet, it's a complete book, just that. So what happens is once in a while, the stereo equipment, some people thought it was hot. It wasn't hot. It was a good kid. Okay. So sometimes we'd go wrong. Now I'm this kid in the street. Okay. In the car, walked into your place of business. Not that you have a stereo. You could be in a pizzeria. You could be working behind the counter. You could be in the haircut. Haircutters were great, by the way. So, but you'd go where there would be money because as a cash register there, they could borrow money from their boss. They had money in their pocket. So you'd go where people had money. And sometimes it would break. And what would happen is, is now they figured I'm screwed. They would call me and I was always a good kid. I did it because I was a good kid. I would go back, drive back wherever it was. Now, it might not have been the next day, but I would make sure, took care of them, replaced it, gave them a brand new. And they were so shocked that this kid who sold me a stereo from the trunk of his car, thought I'd never see him again. I call him. He answers. He comes back. He gives me a brand new one, makes sure I'm happy. They felt obligated to tell every person they knew about me. They felt obligated to buy more. Even if they didn't need it, they would be buying more stuff. They would almost be guilty. So I was like, holy cow, it's almost better if something breaks. Now, I wouldn't want to promote it that way. Anyway, but <laughs> We got it's, you. Yeah, it's, it's almost better if something breaks and you have the opportunity to show your character. And if you are given an opportunity, so negatives can be a great opportunity. It's, it's not the problem. We've all heard this, but it's not the problem. How do you handle the problem? And whatever business you're in, if you do that, you build trust. What made you bring that first one back? It's just the right thing to do. It's just the way I was wired. But yeah, I have to. Wired. It's just the way you're wired. Just the way. I mean, how could you not? I mean, you. And this goes back to that conversation with the customer. Picture yourself as the customer. Don't picture yourself as the salesperson. What did the customer need to know? And if you can empathize to a degree where you're looking at it through their lens instead of yours. Boy, everything becomes easy. I, I shouldn't say easy, but it becomes easier. It becomes easier to connect. Do you feel like empathy is a big part of how yeah, you communicate yeah, I mean, that? Empathy in, to the degree of, I'm not saying empathy that, oh, they've got a sprained ankle. and I'm, you know, I'm, it's, it's not what I'm talking about here. Okay, I'm talking about that's being a kind person. Okay, But I'm talking about empathy from what their scenario is and what's best for them and how your expertise can come in to help what's best for them. That's the empathy I'm talking about. Because that makes a connection. And that builds trust. And once you've got trust, I mean, quite, it's, it's, it's over. It's interesting what you're saying because I remember growing up being very hostile in my own internal battle due to uh, not having the guidance from my parents that I wish I, wish I had. I had a lot of resentment. I took that towards like the entrepreneurial journey. And I was in a sales position where it was a company. I guess the culture was a bit like, if they didn't read that, don't even bring it Boiler up. Boiler room kind of stuff. And I definitely felt empty because I got pulled under that rug. And I think it was, I know it was adversity and personal development that helped me become the man I am today. Was there any, which was, which is the opposite of that. Was there any specific moment in time where you had like some kind of paradigm shift that said, I need to do the right thing. Because so maybe some people go their whole life and never do the right thing. So, you know, um, I, mean, I guess I've been kind of very lucky from the, the onset because my parents were immigrants from Europe. I'm first generation. We were extremely, extremely poor. My parents came here with six suitcases and uh, a lot older. My dad was 57 when I was born. My mom was 40. Now, today, that's not as unusual. But when I was born, that was quite unusual. And... Um, they wanted to have an abortion. I don't blame them, okay? You're dirt poor and you're, you know, you're a lot older and this is a shock that comes out here. Um, by the way, birth control had not have been, was not, so. We, we share a very similar uh, Okay, story. so so yeah, listen uh, to this. So I, I just made it before birth control comes out, yeah. pills come out. I make it just before abortion becomes illegal. So I sneak in in this little window. So I've been on bonus time right from the beginning, right? But, um, but my, my dad passes away when I'm a young boy because he was older. And, uh, and my mom, God bless her, she, she was just the kindest person. And I would see her do things. We were super poor. 
but she would actually teach me lessons as a kid. We'd ride the subway, and if she saw someone in need, we'd have squat for money. But whatever she had, if she saw somebody who needed something, she would give them money. Wow. And she would, she would literally say to me, she would literally say, it's good to help people. You know, it's, so Were yeah, you 8, 9, 10? Kind of, kind of talk, well, even younger than that. Because I was adopted, my mother was 50 when she adopted me. Okay, so go. how blessed are we to yeah. be raised with why, wisdom around yes. us? Yeah. And you, do you believe that's an integral part of how you, be, you wanted to model that behavior? Yeah, because you know the old, the, the old uh, debate, is it nature or nurture, right? Yeah, yeah I think about so, this all you know, the time. Is it nature or nurture? And, and, and boy, I'll tell you what, uh, nature, I think, um, gives you a lot. You know, your, your genetics open doors for you that maybe you wouldn't, you know, athletics or things like that. But um, nurture is your compass. I like that. Nurture is your compass. You know, if, if you are, you know, if you, if you are able to be taught skills and what to do with those skills in the right way, that's great. Almost brings, it makes me think of your company and your culture and how you approach it. Nature is their compass. Yes. So, Going back, let's say you, you first got into mortgages. You you did stereos from the early twenties to when did you get into mortgages? So um, so here's the interesting thing. So uh, I, I started making money in the stereo business. So I, I started, believe it or not, I saw from riding around in my car and seeing different neighborhoods and hiring all my buddies. So we, we started to make quite a bit of money. Team. Yeah, an old wow, team. Okay. We had a ball. Okay. So um, we start making some money, and I I noticed that real estate in different markets was different. Here's the other thing. Talk to people. Okay. Talk to people. I would try and sell realtors. Okay. But I would ask them about their business. You know, what do you think about the market? Why is this good? I always love to learn yeah. just like you. Yeah. So, um, and I like, like people listening. So what you do is when you talk to people and you find things out, what you really discovered or what I discovered here is that there could be some real amazing nuggets and interesting things that happen. So I thought real estate in New Jersey of all places was going to be a good investment because comparatively, it would provide a better value. You were already thinking about this before you got yeah. involved? Yeah. So I was 25 years old. I start buying real estate properties. And boy, this was one an adventure. Some I fixed up. So, you know, imagine me fixing up chimneys and, yeah. and building fences, you know. So thank goodness I don't have to do that anymore. But I have a lot of respect for people who do, yeah. for, believe me. Um, so um, my uncle fired me from painting. <laughs> there you go. There you Forget go. it. <laughs> Wallpaper? No way. I'm doing that ever again. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so, that taught me so many lessons, but I was able to um, buy a lot of properties somewhere for rentals. And I sat down with the guy doing my mortgage one night, just like we're talking here. And you know, remember, talk to people, right? Oh. And I say, so tell me about the mortgage business. How do you guys do? Now, remember, I'm like a 25-year-old kid thinking if I could sell stereos out of the trunk of my car, I could sell anything, right? You know, 25. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, how do the top guys, I'm here, I'm asking about how the top guys do. I'm trying to shoot high here. How do the top guys do when you're in the business, right? And do they make good money, this and that? And he's telling me about this. And I decided I'm going to get into the mortgage business. Because, hey, I had a degree in finance. and economics, So it was, why not try it, right? So um, I, I'm here I am. I'm going to make this attempt. And frick, nobody wanted to talk to this young kid who knew nothing. So at night, I knocked on people's doors and asked them if they wanted to refinance. No, I swear really? To God. Went to different... At night. Co- at night. People threw me out. Some people called the cops. But my third week in the business, I wrote 16 loans. All right, hold on. <laughs> and nobody had ever written that much business in, in the company I was with in the history of the company. And this is before Black Friday, a good year and a half before, right? <laughs> this, was, um, this was in 1986. So it was about uh, a, almost a year and a half before the stock market crash in 87. Correct? So you're... you're- Knocking on doors, Knocking what time doors. is this? Seven at six at night? Yeah, you know, I mean, I would just start and go. I would get a lot of energy, just go. Wow. Just And and 16 <laughs> loans in three weeks. Right my out third, the gate my, of the business. My third week in the business, I wrote 16 loans that week. I had Holy no clue what the hell I was doing. Holy but Holy. but uh, I, I thought that, uh, you know, if I understood the basics and went out there and could save you money, that I could provide value to your family. Well, and you had, so... You had an education in the knowledge, the tacit knowledge necessary to cross pollinate to the mortgage business, yeah. correct? Yeah. What drove you? But in- I devour now. I mean, I, I, I still yeah. today, I read like, like I'm an animal with reading. Oh, I, I don't that. read books 
and, and I know maybe that's a little bit of a weakness because a lot of people say, did you read this book? I kind of feel bad, but I devour so much content mm. that makes me an expert in my field. So I'm probably missing out on, on, on books. So I realize that's a little bit of a week. Maybe I'll make up for that someday. Yeah, I got a reading list somewhere. But, we but, could, but, give me but yours. I, dev I devour a lot of content that would help me do a better, be better at what I do and give me extra. What age did that start? Or was that always something? Very early in the stereo business. I was going to sell. The reason why I became successful, not because, well, the heart is all of us, right? If you, if you have that desire and you want it, and I'll get back to Belichick on this yeah, in a minute. Yeah. The thing is, is that I learned about stereos. I was going to be, I was 21 years old, but I was going to know every single thing about stereo equipment that I could. So when I spoke to a customer, they said, this kid knows what he's talking about. When I did mortgages, this kid knows what he's talking about. Whatever it was, I had to know as much as I could so that the person listening, this is the other part of, of how do you get more conversions. You get trust is gained from telling them everything bad, but also trust is gained from them feeling that the person that they're dealing with has the knowledge that can benefit them. Wow. So if you can help people, you know, Belichick, getting back to him real quick, the other thing is, really wants to tap in, and I think everybody listening should do this, is tap into what motivates you. Because you have to really get that. Now, when I was knocking on doors, what was my motivation? I had three-month-old twins. Dan and Nicole were, were, were three months old. And, and I just uh, met Dan. You just met Dan. That's right? so cool. Yeah. And uh, they were three months old. And here I am. I'm changing jobs. I remember, I'm, I'm a young kid. I, you know, kids do crazy things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So kids do crazy stuff. I'm already two behind. <laughs> so what time is so, it? So here, here, here I am, Jay. I've got these young kids. Wow. I've, there's no choice. There's no way I'm going to let them down, right? So it's whatever it takes. If that takes visiting real estate agents during the day, learning during the day, knocking on doors at night, Whatever it takes, that's what the mentality was because I was motivated and I understood my motivation. So maybe it's your kids. Maybe you want your kid. Find that anchor life. or something. Someone yeah. needs to is find. It, is it the person who's your significant other? Are you doing it for your parents? Now, my, my parents are a huge motivator for me because they made so many sacrifices to give me a chance. So I'm not going to disrespect that. Of course, I'm going to honor that. I'm not going to take what God-given talents I've, I've been given blessed with and lucky enough to have received to not utilize them, mm. to not allow them to benefit other people. I mean, if, if we just kind of took a step back for a second and just think about how fortunate we are and the, and the abilities we have and how can we best use them, I mean, just, just think about what you can do. Like reflect on what are your value props. That's another thing that you need to do is you need to take time to think. Everybody's got a schedule, schedule. How much time are you taking to think? Do you, have thing. you always taken? You have well, to. number one, it's not a weird thing because it's actually the base of culture matters to yeah. read, write, speak, and inspire people to do that. Exactly. So thank you Take for that. Plot. Yes, you're right. Like, like you thinking get it. is important. No, Jay, I mean, you're, you're one of the guys that gets it. Okay. Oh, I mean, you, right, right away, you and I had a connection right away because I, I just. We're spirit animals. We are. We are well, I said we're kindred spirits because you just get it. And What kind of animal would we be? I like sloths. Well, sloths are... Because I, uh, I think they're probably <laughs> controlling the world. Like, they're moving... Anyway. I think we vibrated too high a level to be a sloth, right? But I, I do think that there's a lot of different animals, you know? What time uh, do you invest to think? Is it in the morning? Is it at night? Is I it like through your day? I like to do that in the morning because it's quiet. I like to get up a little early, and then I like to take some time for me to just think. And, and, you know, it doesn't mean you don't think the rest of the day, but, but it's thinking's ritual, important. It's it's yeah, it's kind of ritual. Yeah. Because so you, give you, me the breakdown, right? I'm your, I'm your client. I want to know, is it gratitude? You read some kind of uh, tacit knowledge in your, your business? Prayer, gratitude, um, making sure that you, you just take a step back and just think about where you're going and why are you going there? And, and how are you going to do things that can can get you there and help others? I mean, that's that's really. So you think about what, where you're going. You, so you vision this. Yes, you have to vision. That's you, very abstract. You really have to kind of see it, and then you reverse it in your mind and yeah, plot you, it out. You, you have ha that's that's the way out. Has that you have been... to start here, hmm. and then how am I going to get there? I mean, you have to just get it to Google Map is what it is, right? Just to, you just do it in your brain. When you were like eight, nine, ten, is that how you thought? 
I don't know if it was something I thought that early. It's kind of hard to remember how we thought when we were that. At least it is for me, you know. Um, like but I, I was I was always someone who astute <clears throat> or curious. Yeah, super curious. But you know what? Really creative. And and I think that here's the interesting thing about creativity. For it, what I think my creativity is, I think because I was so poor mm. and I never had anything, that it really it it developed my creativity because we had I had to make up games and stuff because I had nothing. Wow. Everybody else had toys. I had nothing. We used to. We used to make leagues. Me and my friends were poor. Yeah. Uh, how crazy! Matchbooks, okay, that you used to kick when you make field goals because that's all we could do, okay. So you had a league. We had a league. Oh boy, forget it. You put it on paper and this that's and that. Awesome. We'd have scheduled games against each other. <laughs> oh, and then it was always, you know, we record have a little cassette player and you record it, so you'd have it an announcer. Video. Oh, forget it. I'd be announcing it, okay. That's so, so cool. But but we had a ball. It was great. And here we are, super dirt poor very rich wow. in having fun. So I think creativity, we all have it, but we have to be pushed a little bit because sometimes we're given everything mm. and you don't have to. So I don't think you have to start off at an early age. I think you'd be creative now just, and that's what part of the thinking is, mm. is, is, is thinking in not where I'm limited. Think, how do I do something that, that's, that, that hasn't been, I've done so many things that have never been brought to the mortgage industry, understanding the financial markets and, and, and yeah, lock advice, things you, like that. You not only did you door knock at night, which not, I've never heard of anyone doing that. I mean, I knew that you built this crazy business from 86 to 92. 89, you started your own company in the mortgage right. business. Is that correct? Right. correct. And by 92, you had already been the number one mortgage person in history. Not in history, in the country in for, for a couple of years. For a couple of years, for a yeah. Couple of years. Yeah. And then you developed a product that increased... Some Correct. kind of productivity in the mortgage industry. Yeah, you so it's it's un, un, the mortgage industry. Yes, that takes abstract ability. So I, that takes the curiosity. That's the curiosity and the creativity. So we all have that, right? Yeah. It's just I do genuinely believe we all have it. We have to we, uncover we, it. Though. What you really want to do is you want to you want to eliminate points of friction. So I've okay. done some fun things. So I I I, um, I started a medical imaging company with a couple of people. Now I'm not a physician. I've always been interested in medicine, and I kind of learned a lot along the way. But to yeah. people who had that expertise, had the business expertise, we started a medical imaging company. And we did really high level stuff. We did, uh, we, we did PET CT, positron emissions tomography, early detection of cancer. We did cardioendoscopies. We did normal MRI work. We did a lot of that stuff. Wow. And we developed a few centers. But the cornerstone of it, the cornerstone of it was what we did was something very different. Now, I hope to God nobody has to go for a scan or whatever for something bad. I hope the people are healthy. But heaven forbid if you do, we know what it's like. The tech who's doing it, he knows exactly what's going on. She knows exactly what's going on. And you say, well, how's it look? I can't tell you. So now your anxiety makes you freaking nuts for days, right? And then you get the doctor and it's like, why do that? So we had a radiologist right there. By the time you got dressed, brings you in a beautiful room, big TVs, big screen. Here's what's going on right there. If it's bad news, you have at least a plan to address it so you start to feel better. If it's good news, you walk out of there. And people loved us. Built it up to three centers and sold that business. That's fantastic. Would have had Rock of Ages on Broadway. We So Broadway's very funny, right? Very stodgy old stuff. Here I come with a lot of ideas, right? This, this guy's a, this guy, forget this, this, this crazy man. Guy? Yeah, right, exactly. And by the way, that's the way they would treat me. Oh, you're more, you don't know any of this stuff, right? So there were so many ideas that I had and so many things that I did differently and creatively. But one that stands out that I'm really proud of because now it's spread through all of Broadway yeah. is I would watch people before the show started and they would spend 15 bucks for a drink and then they'd be dressed nicely and then the lights would flick a thing down, gotta get to your seat, you can't bring a drink to the seat. So I'd watch these women freaking guzzled. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. So they, why are you making this woman do that? Why don't you just allow them to bring the seat, the, the, the drink to their seat? We don't do that. It's never been done before. Well, that's not an answer that I accept very easily. Okay? I, wow. So, I mean, you can kind of tell yeah, the way. I like that, though. So, fought, got it done with the first show in the history of Broadway, Rock of Ages, to allow drinking the seats. And now they, and now they all do it. And now they, now they all do amazing. it. But so what are we trying to do? Huh. Creativity. Eliminate points of friction. So if you see something, if it doesn't seem right, how can we fix it out of the box a little time to think? So if you see a problem... Envision how you can solve it and work your way backwards. Bingo. You've always thought it's like you're, that's your 
That's kind of a good blueprint of how it is. I don't know if it's always been that way or it's been trial and error. Hey, look, by the way, you, you, you've been very kind to me. You've been allowing me to talk about things that went well. There's been a lot of stuff that went bad. Okay. So much stuff that went if bad. If you, knowing what you knew today, yeah. if you were to give yourself advice in 1992, what would it be? Oh, gosh. Oh, boy. How much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's... There's so much advice that, uh, that I would give. Um, I think that, that it's, it's hard to pinpoint one thing. There's a lot of things. But what's important is that you need to, all of us need to understand we're not always going to make the right decisions. A lot of times we're going to make wrong decisions. When do you do the course correct? Because that's where the magic happens. Okay, If you're lucky enough to always make the right decisions, God bless you. I mean, you're, you're very lucky. I was not that lucky. I made a lot of wrong decisions. But I think the difference for me personally, and I think what could help a lot of people, is when you sense something is not going the way it should. And I'm not saying throw the towel in immediately. You want to, you want to give something a chance. But if you could just sense it, I'm not saying also you have to throw in the towel completely, but you may have to course correct and just do something a little bit different. So whether it's a business, an yeah. idea, it could be a relationship, a partnership. If you're it doesn't noticing mean throwing something, the towel. Look at look at go back to Bill Belichick, right? Yeah. Why is he so great in the second half? Because he makes the adjustments. Okay. So by the way, uh -huh. if it is a relationship, I'm not saying throwing the towel on your relationship, but do you have to do something differently to make it work better? In your business, you have to do something differently. And a lot of that is some of the things you're talking Is it emitting about. maybe a potential logical mistake so you don't let your emotions drive it? Heck yeah, but you know what? You also have to be humble too because some people are married to their idea. They think that, that heck, drop that, okay? It starts with humility. You know, we're, we're going to screw up. I'm going to screw up. I'm going to make mistakes, okay? Yeah. Uh, realize that. Um, realize that you can learn from others and you can learn a lot from people who you may have had more previous success than, who may be people that work for you, who may know less from, than you in other areas. You Hold can on. learn a can lot. Can you tell that to every Fortune 500 CEO right now? Yeah, yeah right. But, but you can, you can learn. We're going into the millennial conversation. Yeah, you, you, can, you can learn a lot from those people um, if, you, if you know what to look for, if you have some humility. Now, I'm not saying listen to them. If they don't know anything, give you this idea and abandon everything you know. I'm saying... If, your brain's an amazing computer. Get this input, process it with humility, mm. and don't look for, you know, uh, look for what's the, the, the best answer, okay? Look, look for the best solution, the best path. These are the things that we need to try and do. On a are you basis. seeing that being even more important in the technological age? We were talking before the cameras went on about the millennial conversation, about how fast things are moving. So, you know, it's amazing. Uh, you, you said this to me, you know, we were walking before, right? And, and you know, we just kind of made a comment because someone d didn't hold the door, which, which I think is just so freaking awful. How do you not have the courtesy to just hold the door and be a, a nice person? Or people walk by and they won't say, hey, how you doing? Hi. Just so nice, yeah, you know? Like, yeah. And it's almost when you say hi to them, that's, for that's awful, okay? I'm like, change that. If that's you, just change that right now, okay? Don't be that person. So we were talking about it and you said, well, technology empowers you even more because you get on an elevator and everybody's looking at your phone. And here's the thing. I think we talked about if you're at a, a, a train station, you know, everybody's doing this. Yeah. And this has all happened with regards to your mobile device very, very recently. So, you know, you stare at the darn thing how many times a day? I, mean, I think on average it. it's like 40. But, oh, no, it's not 40. It's Is it 40 more? In, it's 40 in an hour. 40 okay. an hour? Yeah, maybe it's more than that in an hour. Think about how many times you stare at your phone throughout the day, okay? Uh, it, it's probably in well, several... Well, me or other people? Because I think I'm worse. Mo most people, it's several <laughs> yeah. hundred. Several hundred. Several hundred yeah. More than you stare at your, your child. More than you stare at the person who's the love of your life. More than you do... You are looking at this... And it didn't exist 11 years ago. So think about how quickly the world changes. And Moore's Law says that it's exponentially changing. So in the last 10 years, we've seen more change in the last 100. Are you a fan history. of Ray Kurzweil? I'm not educated on what it you. is. So that's, well, it might be your twin because he go. talks about Moore's Law. Yeah, so, so, so Moore's Law is, is talking about compression of time and technology. Okay. So what I would be thinking about right now, and to, to kind of take a look at the, the famous Wayne Gretzky quote, don't go where the puck is, go where the puck's going to be. 
knowing how things are changing, don't be dragged along in this. Don't be a passenger in this. If you really want to make a difference, and I don't care what the difference is. I don't care if it means personally you get enriched with financials, if you're able to help more people, touch more people, grow something. Whatever is going to be wonderful in your life, a good way to do it would not to be to watch this happen and be dragged along. It's to anticipate where it's going and meet it there in advance. So it's like when I talk about being a consumer versus being a creator. Yeah. Like we're investing time to learn each other and have it on film so we can hopefully add value to someone that's watching. We're creating. That's exactly right. You, you want to be in the position of anticipating where, where things are going. Do you have any thoughts on where things are going and how that's going, how that is affecting the mortgage industry. Zillow just rated you number one foresight on Zillow in the mortgage business. So something well, of that man. potential. I yeah, mean, I the, saw uh, that. That's crystal amazing. Ball, crystal ball you award. have the crystal ball award. So, so what you. is, you know, the wizard of Oz? So, <laughs> That's a great I'm behind story. the that's, curtain. That's a, that's a great story, by the way. I talk about that in my seminars. The Wizard of Oz, one of my favorite things to talk about. Oh, really? The behind the scenes of The Wizard of I'm Oz. I'm telling you, we're sloth. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so so I, I think uh, that what we really have to try to do is pay attention very carefully to how quickly technology is relentlessly trying to replace us. So if I were listening, especially if I were in sales, um, I, I say this with love, but you have a target on your back. And, and I want you to be protected from that because mm. technology is relentlessly trying to replace you. And you have to do work that's unscalable. You have to do things that technology cannot easily replace. Let's take a lesson from travel agents, right? Now, oh. travel agents used to be on every corner, everywhere, but the work that they did was easily re replaced and hence travel agents are effectively extinct. And if you're a millennial listening to this, you're probably saying, what the frig is a travel agent, right? I don't know. The, do, do, you, do, do you mean travel. Travago or Travelocity? What? That's a travel agent. Airbnb. No, right. Airbnb, right. That's a travel agent. Right? Yeah. No, there used to be agencies and travel. You know, this is what was it. People a, actually did it. This was an enormous, enormous, enormous vocation. And it's been eliminated. Stockbrokers used to be everywhere. And then came $9 online trading. And why should I pay this guy 200 bucks instead of nine? So if you're going to take a lesson from the stockbroker and say, there are still stockbrokers out there and they're making a lot more, what have they changed? They've gone from being salespeople to advisors. And look, if you're in the real estate or mortgage business and you're saying, well, you know, okay, I'm, I think I'm an advisor. I'm saying, are you really? Are you really? Okay, so number one point is how, how you can make sure you're not commoditized is the value you bring to your customer. It's, it's got to be an unscalable value. So how does someone do that? And like are the three main things at least? Well, look, it, it, here, here's the thing is, is first of all, be, begin with humility because it's easy. It's, oh yeah, I'm an advisor. Really? What do you do that couldn't be replaced by your phone? Okay. So when you uh, uh, define humility as if like asking yourself those questions, of, yeah. what do I really bring? Yeah. To one of table? my favorite stories is this guy, Ignat Samelweis. Okay. So in the 1850s, he worked in the hospitals in, in Europe, and he worked in the wealthiest of hospitals and the poorest of hospitals. So he was an assistant in childbirth. So you know, at the time, he noticed that infant mortality was much better in the poorer hospitals. Why were children surviving better in the poorer hospitals and dying off like crazy in the richer hospitals? Why? And he said, boy, when the poor people come in, they come in dirty, and they have to wash them and wash their hands. So he said to the physicians in the wealthy hospitals, I've got it. You can improve the survival rate of births, infants, if you just wash your hands. The physicians were not showing any humility. They, in fact, were insulted. You're going to insult me? What do you know? Remember I said you can learn a lot from the people yeah. who maybe you don't think are, are, are at that level? Okay, they could have learned a lot from him. So they said, I'm not going to insult my patients. I'm not going to wash my hands because you said so. What do you know? What are your qualifications? And they committed him because they were so insulted, they said, you must be insane to say this. The poor guy's not insane. They beat him to death. Oh they beat him to death in the, in, the, in the mental institution. The same year they beat him to death, Louis Pasteur comes out with the bacteria theory, and Joseph Lister, Listerine, Joseph Lister, wow. comes out with the germ theory. In fact, washing your hands works. So the question you should start off with is, are you too good to wash your hands? Because if you're not too good to wash your hands, there's so much that you can do by learning. So yes, so start wow. off first of all, and it's a kind of a long way to get back to where we were, to say, 
you, you, you start off with, with humility and, and looking at what you're doing. Because if they're not open, they can't be curious Bingo. to become that advisor. Bingo. And how can they be competent for their, for their clients? So how Bingo. could they not be commoditized? Exactly. So if you are able to say, hey, look, am I willing to change the way I'm doing business because I could see where the puck is going? Okay, and I could see if I'm here, I'm going to have a tougher time. If I could see this is a travel agent, this is the other stockbrokers. I want to be the good stockbroker. Okay, I want to go where the puck's going, and by doing that, I need to be an advisor. So here's where I said, are you really an advisor? Because if the work you're doing is the price of, oh, I know how to qualify somebody, I know how to read a tax return. Come on, are you kidding me? Wake up, a realtor. I know how to perform these functions. No, look, if you're in the mortgage business. You're really not in the mortgage business because nobody wants a freaking mortgage. Who wants a mortgage? Okay, I mean, really, the, the, no, no, nobody wants a mortgage. <laughs> what they want is money. Money's the vehicle to purchase real estate. You're in the business of making people's dreams come true by giving them their the, the home that they want. You're in the real estate business. It's a financial transaction. Understand the finances of real estate. Mm. What's the opportunity? What's not what the value of that home is today. What is going to so be you're a mortgage professional? Understand the real estate you have to business understand. like crazy. And by the way, think about how you dominate and crush your competitors who aren't. Think about the real estate agent who knows so much more because they see what the value of that property and the market conditions affecting the financial aspects of it into the future. None of your competitors are doing it. Then, if you're a mortgage professional, you want to build a relationship with real estate professionals because they're with the home buyers. And don't listen and don't think. Look. There, so, list my list my home dot com ninety nine dollars to list your home. Realtors have an enormous target on their back. Yeah. Okay, mortgage professionals an enormous target on their back. If you do work that these online companies don't do, if you approach the transaction with your customer in a way that builds trust, mm -hmm. you have an enormous advantage. And it can't just all be fluff in a relationship. Get, well, I hear people say, well, you know, my customers love me. I'm friendly. I'm this. And that. All good, all nice. Don't bank on that. There was a lot of friendly travel agents. They're gone. Interesting. In the beginning of your mortgage career, what made you decide to start that company? Because you went from barreling through there a thousand miles an hour, digesting all the content possible to be the best version of you. What was that transition? What was I think it was, I was 29 years old. And before I was 30, I really, I'd been self-employed before in the stereo business. And I just had a desire to do things the way I wanted to do them because I could see the envision. So <laughs> I could see the vision for what I had for a culture in the company and how I wanted to treat people in my organization and how I wanted to treat my customers was very different. And I wanted to call the shots for that. You know, I'm very generous, and I think that's important. See, I really believe in building goodwill. And a lot of people are afraid to build goodwill because you will invariably get screwed over by building goodwill from some people. You don't do it for them. You do it for the people that appreciate it, and most will. And the people that appreciate it will help you grow and build your business incredibly well. So build goodwill. You don't have to take every nickel off the table. You don't have to. Be a good human being. Be kind. Be generous. Let people almost feel like they're almost taking advantage because they won't want to lose that situation. If your employees feel like, wow, I'm appreciated, I'm valued, and not just with words, with deeds, you know, they'll go through a brick wall for you because if they believe in what you're doing, if you allow them to see the vision and share the vision and share what you're trying to do, I think good leaders do that. Mm -hmm. I think that good leaders inspire. And, and, and if you can inspire someone, it's not an easy thing, it's an easy thing to say. It's not an easy thing to do. You gotta find out what's in here. And you have to really touch that person there, you know? Were there points where you started that business and there, you know, we've talked about success, we've talked about failure. What was done from 1986 to 1990, do all that business that you did, and then developing a company? Was there a big learning curve or growth e curve for you? Enormous. And I was very ill equipped to start my own company at 29. I've made every mistake in the book. I remember we'd be waiting for the mail to come in to see if any checks come in so we can make payroll, okay? I, I mean, we, we, it was a struggle. It was a struggle. The market had turned. I opened my company, okay, in, 88, the market fell out. in 1989, and then you had the housing bust. Rates go up, housing busts, 
all these companies go out of business. I'm like, I just opened. <laughs> I just opened. <laughs> so, just so oh, I just started. It was it was scary. And had you been doing well before that? I was doing really well. Really and it was well. it was the same thing when I was in the mortgage business in 2001 and started Mortgage Market Guide. Yeah. So uh, rates were just dropping. People are doing. I'm watching all my buddies make all this free money. I've got a startup business. I'm struggling in a startup business and. You know, fortunately, we, you know, we were okay, and we started to grow, and we, we became, we became uh, well-received very quickly. Well, from 1989 to 1992, you went from struggling to number one in the country. In, How in the, the mortgage, heck did in the you mortgage do that? Industry. That essentially was taking the approach of being an advisor. That's all that was. There... That was converting almost every conversation I had, whether my rate was higher or not. And I don't mean, uh, look, if I'm a half a percent higher, uh, you know, forget it. But yeah. if I'm an eighth higher, I wasn't losing that transaction. The person on the other end of the phone or the person I met with in person developed trust with me because I told them everything bad. They were confident in my knowledge. I advised them on how they would create wealth. And I took the difference in rate. And I, everybody knows, for example, 5% is higher than 4 and 7 eighths. You can't play that game. Okay. And then you have these, these people that are out there, oh, rate doesn't matter. Rate matters. People want to know. Okay, But what I would do is I would quantify it. I would quantify it to the pennies per day that it would wind up costing. And then I would say, would it make an impact in anything you've done? Look, today, today, yeah, if you yeah. did somebody's loan and the difference were, you know, an eighth in rate on roughly a $300,000 loan, it would come out to about 50, 60 cents a day if you broke it down to, and you break it down first by what is a month. So first give them that because they're still talking eighths, which mean nothing. Then take it weekly. And what would it buy? A cup of Starbucks coffee if you can get it. And then daily. And then ask this question. If you made an extra 50 cents a day, could you now buy a sports car? Could you go on vacation to Tahiti? Could you buy a big screen? Could you do anything more with it? Obviously, the answer is no. But I'd ask him this honestly. Yeah. And then if, if you lost 50 cents a day, would you not be able to go to the movies anymore with your family? Would you not be able to send your kid to college? Would you not be able to hire a landscaper? Would you not be able to go out to dinner anymore? Would it, would it impact one single decision in your life? And the answer is no. So why are you making me crazy about it? Can't we focus on what's really important and what's really going to create wealth for you and making the right decision, locking at the right time, choosing the right program, buying the right home, understanding where it's going to go from here, because that's the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And every realtor listening to this, this impacts you because every single one of you gets in that situation when the buyer and the seller are apart by three or four or five thousand dollars. And when you're in that mode, in order to overcome that, Either the buyer has to come up that amount of money and maybe add it to their mortgage. It's the same thing. It's 50 cents a day. The seller has to come down that and take it on the new house and increase their mortgage by three or four or five. It's 50 cents a day. Would it impact one decision? Sell the home and move on. Buy the home and move on. What's a resounding profundity to me is that you tell the truth. Yeah. You're... Selling, no, you're telling the truth. And I'm I think higher in rate. not enough people in the world are open, curious, think, take action, and tell the truth. Yeah, I mean, that's really critical because look, we talk about trust as the most important thing, right? So yeah, you have to. You have to. Tell them all the bad stuff. I'm higher in rate than, than, than you somebody see else. A lot in of people in business, maybe they're afraid to tell the truth or they lack the confidence to have a real conversation with another human. You know, in South America, there's these spider monkeys and they're really, really, really hard to capture. They're very valuable. They're nocturnal, you know, so the hunters try and figure out how am I going to capture these very valuable spider monkeys. They came up with an ingenious idea. They made a box. It's a very heavy box and it's got vents in it. So they put food in it. The monkeys can smell this food. They go nuts for it at night. They come out, they shake the box and these smart monkeys find a tiny slit in the box just enough to slide their hand in there. They get the food and they go to take it out. But because their fist is there, the slit won't accommodate their fist being released with the food. So they essentially trap themselves and the hunters grab them because they refuse to let go. Wow. So as a salesperson, are you trapping yourself or should you just let go and experience the freedom that will allow you to do so much more? I mean, this is such an important point you bring up because you say, are, are, are you limiting yourself because you're afraid to tell the truth, because you're afraid to point out all the bad stuff? Those limiting beliefs are going to come through to the, to, in the customer side. Maybe you can get over on somebody, but it's not going to build your business forever because eventually they're going to find out. It reminds me of your uh, ethos, the way you view your life and your business of being competent, being an advisor, knowing what you're doing. It's easy to tell the truth. It's easy to tell the truth because guess what? 
not everybody is going to be your customer either. So don't be afraid of that. So one of the things that I learned how to do is I learned how to juggle. And, and you know, God bless my kids. They're, they're, like they're also, physically juggle? Yeah. Yeah. So I learned how to juggle. And uh, I taught my son Dan to juggle. He's amazing. He could do four things. He does behind the back. But my claim to fame is I taught him. You know, and Jake and Jared the same way. They're, they, whatever it is, my claim to fame is I was able to teach them. But for me, when I learned, my teacher, first thing they taught me, you want to be a good juggler? Yes. You, there's a certain pattern that you do, okay, to, to start off with. So it's a one, two, you start with your non-dominant hand, one, two, and then drop, drop. You let him drop. Drop, drop. And it's like, why, why am I dropping him? He says, because the first thing you understand is that sometimes they're going to drop. And you'll never be a good juggler if you're always panicked to catch them. If you can reconcile that things are going to drop, you'll be able to be a better juggler. And that's true in life. Not everybody's going to be your customer. You're not going to get everybody. If you want to be a great person in sales, understand that not everybody's going to be your customer. So you let go. Those that aren't going to be my customer, I'm okay with that. I'll be fine with the ones that are. I'm doing it for them. That's amazing. You know? Jay, you're, you're a terrific speaker. And we've all had this. I've had huge crowds that I've spoken for, enormous crowds, you know, uh, very humbling to me to have thousands and thousands of, spe of people to speak before. And it's, it's so amazing to have that energy. But there's also times, for whatever the reason, there's a very small crowd. And I'm talking a very small crowd. Could be three and, people. Uh, so, so there's not a lot of energy there, okay? And you've traveled. You've gotten dressed, you've gone through everything, and of course, I mean, I'm a, I prepare like crazy, okay? Some people, I do one presentation. I tailor it for that audience, for where I am. It's painstaking. I'll show you. Every single one, we do it from the, preparation's really important to me, okay? So I prepare, prepare, a professional. Even if it's only three people there. So here's the thing, I'm gonna to get to that. A professional boxer trains a thousand minutes for every minute they're in the ring, okay? Just think about that. So how much training are people doing before they're in the ring, meaning on the phone with a customer, or if we're speaking to a group, that's a lot for me. And what I look at is, I'm not there, like sometimes let's just say it was terrible weather and so many people didn't show. I was expecting 100 people, I got 15, okay? Bad snowstorm, whatever it was. Instead of getting down on it, I'm not there for the people that didn't show. I'm there for the person that drove two hours, mm -hmm. that got up early that morning, that said, I'm going to go there to learn something. And that's what motivates me to do a really great job for that person. We, we are spirit animals. Yeah. I just told somebody yesterday that they, uh, there, was a, there was a speech that they gave on a Sunday. He talked to him yesterday. And he sounded a little, he's like, because I was in Vegas. He was like, yeah, it's okay. Not a lot of people came. And I said, brother, Stalin, Charles Manson, and Jim Jones had parents. What if they heard you speak? Could have changed a lot. When you think lot. of it like that. Could have changed a lot. Yeah, Could have changed a lot. So it's, that's why we do it. That's why we do it. Acting. Yes. I, Liam Neeson is a, is a, uh, I guess someone I've always looked up to because I saw a story of him and getting him. He was a, like, what is that in the warehouse where you drive a little truck and mm -hmm. you pick up cargo forklift. and forklift. That's what he was doing, but and he was attempting to become an actor in his later 40s or maybe 50s or something. I've all, that is on the bucket list. It's going to happen. You've been in eight m movies. I, I want to say either five or eight a little, movies. A little bit more than that, but that's okay. But that's yeah. yeah some of them, if you blink, movies. some of them, if you blink, you'll miss me. But okay. yeah, there has been this fascination in the in the theater of yourself. Where does that come from? Why? How does so, that work? So, um, how do I do that? Like, yeah, well, well how look, does that work? Pre presenting is, is something that I've always wanted to do when I was early in the mortgage business. And that was more because that was leverage, okay? Being able to talk one on one is great, but boy, if you have a room full of people that you're addressing, a lot more leverage. And there's something about that person who is on stage that the license of being on stage doesn't mean everything is great, but it gives you the chance to show them what you've got to show them you put the preparation in, and then maybe you'd get more people to work with you. So I started there. And then I started professional speaking. There's a lovely woman, Deborah Jones, gave me a chance to speak professionally. My wow. first gig, St. Louis, 15 people, my first gig, and I was nervous as could be, okay? So it was very humble beginnings to, to do that. But then at the same time, in the early 90s, I got a chance to do some TV. I'd done a lot of writing, 
So write your thoughts. If you're listening to this, write, oh. write, 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 okay? So, yeah. so write your thoughts and, and really be a little bit of a grammar Nazi too, okay? Because it's, it's really important you understand oh. grammar. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard. It, it, much easier to talk shunk, than it is to write. Ever, that Shunk book? I got a book no. for it. It's in my bag. No. Another good one is, yeah. bir is Bird to Bird. That's another really good one for writing. Oh, yeah. Bird uh, to Bird. So, what is her name? Yeah, yeah, Anne, yeah. You got Anne it. Lamont. Anne, Anne Lamont. Yep, Anne you Lamont. It. You got it. Yes. You got it. All You're right. Like, wait, can you give me back? I'll just show him the Shunk book. So, okay, anyway. so anyway, so the, the, thing, the thing that um, is really important about what that did was it allowed clarity of thought, um, and it also allowed people to see. I got a chance to do... There you go. Uh, Sloths. Sloths. I'm, I'm a. Go. I was. I was. Chaos. And by the way, I like books, order. I, I like books like that. By the way. Oh, <laughs> so, we'll we'll talk about that. So, anyway, so, so yeah. So yeah. So when you are able to, when you're able to um, have an opportunity like that on CNBC, like I was. I mean, look, God blessed me in that there were callers that came in, live callers. And I really helped these people out. They wrote to CNBC saying, this guy really helped me. He wow. gave me great advice. And they kept calling me back. And then they gave me my own spot for 13 years. I had the monthly mortgage report. And, and then, you know, so, so now they kind of like to do their own mortgage stuff, which is okay. So they don't really call me that much. I do Fox once in a while. Uh, but that was a different way to present, okay. right? But it was my persona, my persona, my persona, right? Even if in the band, you know, it's kind of my persona when I'm on stage. When I started acting, it started because on CNBC, when I did a, a, a segment, someone, re they really liked my voice, right? So, they, so you have a really distinct voice. voice. Thanks, man. I have yeah. a face for radio, that kind of thing. I've been telling. <laughs> so, 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 so when I, when I had um, spoken to them, they said, listen, we're doing this kid's movie, and we'd like you to play this character with this booming voice. Um, so Colonel Kaboom was my first Colonel role. Kaboom. Colonel Kaboom. So Colonel Kaboom was my first role. And, but, you know, I like people. I talk to people. I, like people. I, I, I get along with people. So I like to learn from them. You know, yeah. just, just, you know, not too, not, not too good to wash my hands. You know, what do you do? What, what, you know, um, and wound up getting opportunities in other movies. And that led me to this other movie called Barry Monday, which is a great movie. Great cast. Great movie. Very funny movie. Heartwarming movie. Oh. Amazing cast. So I've got a good role in that movie. I play, I play Dr. Habib. So I have to tell I have to tell Patrick Wilson I removed his testicles. That's, that's <laughs> serious. Dead serious that I removed his testicles. So here he is a big Romeo, and his, the the dad of a young girl he's with. Wax he's blonde, him. right? Patrick Wilson. Patrick. No, I've seen that. I think. Oh yeah. well. So anyway, so listen. The, by the way, I made the trailer. If you pull up Barry Monday, yeah, I got to look that up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Patrick Wilson was in those horror movies. He was in City. Yes, he was. He I wasn't. met him in Montclair, New Jersey. I was By getting the way, ice cream one time. He's a great guy. He's I a, love that. We used guy. to play softball together too. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. I'll so, never forget. This was yeah. the only celebrity that he, he was a big fan of Rock of Ages. Yeah. But anyway, so so um, Beautiful young boy, great, great, eyes, great cast. Malcolm Mc, Malcolm McDowell was in it, wow. Billy D. Williams, Sybil Shepherd, Chloe Sevigny, Gene Smart. It was a great cast. Yeah. Okay. So um, the director and writer. Uh, Chris Dorenzo, you know, a friendly guy. So I'm talking to Chris. We're talking about stuff, you know, tell him a little about what I do in the real world and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so I'm in Chris's trailer and we're looking at the dailies. That's what, you know, what you shot the previous day and this and that. And we're looking at my scene and he's kind of pointing stuff out to me because here's the other thing about acting, okay? <laughs> as decent of a presenter as I think I am or as good as I might have been on occasion on TV or whatever, man, acting's a whole other game. Because you're not in your persona. you got to be in a different persona. And memorizing lines is not freaking easy. It is so hard. I don't know how they do it. Okay? So, so anyway. Well, they get the big bucks. Right? So, so they get the big bucks. Yeah. So, um, so anyway. So, but I, 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 I muddled through. I was good. So he's pointing out stuff. All the stuff I did wrong. Right? So, and which is great for me because I want to improve. Mm. So I'm trying to learn. And, and he's pointing out stuff to me. And then, you know, I guess he kind of took a liking to me, you know, because I was a humble guy trying to learn, laughing at stuff together, making jokes. We were laughing at, at all the stupid stuff I did, right? So you got to laugh at yourself, right? Um, so he shows me the script for Rock of Ages. And uh, he says, you know, I'd really like to do this. I've got to get financing for it and this and that. So I loved it. And me and four other guys, we took a big chance and we put it off Broadway. People went nuts for it, and we had a chance to go on Broadway. That's a good thing I didn't know how hard it was. Good thing I was super ignorant about it because I would have never done it. Then we put the big bucks up, put it on Broadway.
By the way, I should have known I was in trouble because the theater owner, the Nederlanders, were already trying to book the next show before we opened because they figured we'd run for six weeks. Damn. Dead serious. So yeah, the odds were stacked against you. And I think Super that's the stacked. best selling at uh, 27. 20, bingo. Yeah. 27 longest running show. We ran for six years. Tw that's five cool. Tonys. It was, it was really five Tony. it, 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 uh, nominations. It was, the, it okay. was the most amazing life experience. It was just an incredible, incredible life experience. Well, I could, and I couldn't imagine how much that stretched you as a person just to get out of your culture. Yes. Something I see all the time now working with larger organizations and individuals in that position is if they don't get out of their culture... It creates what I call a yes man effect. Yeah. And the liar lid that we talked about earlier forms where yep. they just don't grow. And, and by the way, the real important aspect for people to understand about this is as follows, is people will want to pigeonhole you. You won't get any credibility in the medical business, Barry, because you're a mortgage guy. You won't get any credit on Broadway because you're just a businessman. You have no creativity. Okay, so many things I did for that show was so creative and so funny that I changed and added. Okay, so much negativity. Oh, they hated me because I had I did this guy. Forget about him. Put him in a little box. As a matter of fact, when we did the movie, okay, so Warner Brothers, this was the epitome of it. Okay, I got a nice credit for executive producer on it. I think I'm going to have involvement. You know what they said? Here's a chair. It's got your name on it. Sit in the shade. <laughs> Zero input for me. Oh, Zero on the movie. So anyway, but here's... here's so the, no matter the, what, we're always climbing. But, but here's the thing, is that if somebody speaks several languages, you say, man, they're really smart. That's great. They speak several languages. But if somebody knows several businesses, you want to put them down. Mm. So just think about that. And, and so it starts with us. Don't be afraid to explore. And it also means that don't shut people out and don't let people shut you out because they want to pigeonhole you just because they haven't broken into different things. Wow. Explore wow. what makes you happy. Explore your creativity. You may find you're really good at a lot of things. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean you're not good at a whole heck of a lot of other stuff too. I love that. And would you say that no matter what or how high you achieve or strive, no matter what, there's always obstacles? Always obstacles. And boy, I'll tell you, one is confidence, man. I'll tell you what. So, look, I've had a lot of roadblocks, a lot of things had to overcome, even health-wise. You know, I've had situations that have been, you know, kind of scary. You know, back in 2012, I was, was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's follicular lymphoma, and you hear cancer, you, you know, it's, and it's not something I talk about. It just, you know, because, but it's very scary. It's just another thing to have to overcome, you know, and... Uh, I was just in a Vegas at, at, a, at the Lightspeed Seminar, and... There was an individual, is one of the larger speakers in Vegas, and he just got diagnosed with uh, some form of blood disease, and it was you know a serious thing. And it's like, what are you going to do other than move forward with mentally, right? I mean, what I so a year ago I was actually in the, in in an accident. My my whole arm is a scar down it. I it was in a car accident, and I almost lost my. Well, they said you will never be able to use your hand again. September twenty second, two thousand seventeen. So that actually, that accident, which no one even knows Wait, how serious. Just recently. Oh yeah, like this. There's, there's a scar like that's, all the way down that's my just arm. Recent. I was in an ATV with a mortgage professional, <laughs> and they flipped it over, and the whole, the whole vehicle, thousand pounds, went on my arm and ripped it apart. So the whole thing was. It's on YouTube. I'll show you later. Uh, I had, a, I took a video of it, uh, and uh, it was got some really good content. Oh God! Went to the hospital. <laughs> yeah, there was no blood, but what it was dedication. all mangly. Oh, I saw it. Yeah. What dedication. Yeah, I was like, culture matters. You'll love it. So if it weren't for that experience, that was like 700 I, leagues under. I was, I was under the sea in my confidence. Overcoming that, I wanted to quit. I wanted to give up on my life. You know what got me through it? What brought us together? Facebook. Yeah. Videos. Putting, I put a video out. I was very emotional. And the support that I received... You know, there's no family that I'm calling like, oh, hi, I'm help. Jay, what you did was you tapped into what motivates you. And that's what we talked about earlier, but everybody, as like going back to the Belichick, tap into what motivates you, right? So I was ready to never need it again. Like I came to terms that I would never need it again because my power came from my mind, mm -hmm. reading, writing, sharing. And I, and the funny part, you would appreciate this because you're, you're a closer. It was a lot easier to... Get that new coaching client when you just slide the contract, <laughs> slide it down, you know, and then you shake a shake, you know, shake a limp hand. 
Well, <laughs> you know, you, and then one day it just uh, woke uh, up. Well, well, I'll tell you what, though. It just um, woke up. It's, <laughs> that's, God, thank no God. one even knows it happened. I don't tell people. Yeah. I don't put it out on social media. When we speak at high schools, if a kid sees my arm sometime, I'll bring it up. But there's all sorts of stuff to talk about to motivate that's, him. That's, that's but amazing. I literally, yeah, it's the best but thing that ever happened but, for me. But you want to know something? But that's, you know, taking that, taking those obstacles and having them turn into something positive, right? It's just, what do you do? It's all the things we've been talking about that you're embodying. And, you know, confidence we talked about as well. You know, that gave you the confidence. When I, regardless of how, you know, there's a lot that went wrong and a lot that I've learned from, but I had made some accomplishments that I thought were nice accomplishments. And then I, when I started MBS Highway, we were growing and then we kind of plateaued for a while. And, you know, regardless of what you've done in the past, you, like, you ask yourself, you know, am I doing something wrong now? Have I lost my ability to do... You, you, you really question yourself. And that's where, you know, thinking and believing in yourself. And that's where that course, course correct comes in. Because we were heading down a path that was similar to what was working in the past. But I was going where the puck was. I wasn't going where the puck was going to be. And I had stopped doing that for a short period of time. Made the change. And now, fortunately, I mean, we're growing like, like crazy. And people are really seeing value and we have a great time. We push ourselves every day. We're constantly new. Yeah, creations. you're adding tons of value tons to the mortgage tons of value. industry. But it's all, and we keep on doing it. Like every three weeks we do a push with new stuff. So it's like, it's a challenge. What else can we do? Not just to do it, but that's meaningful. That's impactful. What can we do? So I just want to kind of close with you about culture because that is, you know, culture does matter. It's really important. You know, the, the, the things that you're teaching are so critical because you spend a lot of time at work and, and, and you better inspire those people to believe what you see and what, what let them in. You know, don't, don't keep it, keep everything, let them in. Share the successes, make them a part of it. Make them feel and, and show them what the difference that they're making. You know, we get so many wonderful remarks and comments. I make sure they see the difference that they're making in people's lives. And that's the key. People wanna know that they're relevant. People want to know that the work that they're doing translates. Could be our receptionist who's wonderful, but we try and explain to our receptionist, Christine. What, Christi, Christine see, so you think you, you're awesome, but you remembered her name, but the difference that she makes in people when she talks to them. The, every individual here, I, I, I mentioned here that our, our tech team, we bring them in on the successes. We tell them the why behind it. We uh, let them see how these benefits that we're, we're, we're giving to our subscribers are changing their lives, how it's changing the Was that Avi life. that was sitting with the technic and he knew uh, what to... Yeah, exactly. Avi is great at communicating that to the teammates there. So, so he's, he helps with both the, um, the market side mm -hmm. and the tech side. He's, a, he's, he's very valuable in being able to translate that on both. Well, ways. I can say I've, I've definitely been into a lot of organization when I wasn't asked to be there. And when I have been asked to be there, when I came in, I could feel the energy, the culture, which is a, after this conversation is a clear reflection of your character. Well, and true. like we could talk, we're going to do this again. Yes. Like we, there's we so much. I, on the final word, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself before you, before your knuckle touched that first door in mortgages, like before this whole thing started, what would you say to yourself? I would, um, I would definitely remind myself to never quit. That um, it's going to, you're going to have a lot of adversity, and to always, always overcome those adversities. To believe in yourself enough, to have the confidence in yourself enough, to know that if you were to. Um, if you were to give it, be given enough time, enough resources, enough support, and enough desire, that it's all in here that you can overcome almost any adversity. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks That's brother. awesome. Thanks, brother.